So as I said, I mean, most of the people that are in this room, I'm assuming are empaths or have been have someone close to them that is an empath that they, don't, they are a little bit baffled by. And I immediately want to grab your attention by suggesting that I think an empath is an evolution of a new archetype, which we will discuss. But I would like you to sit and track what's going to be said, because even in the first 10 minutes of this conversation, we're going to discover the most mind-blowing facts, like the fact that there is actually a very natural life cycle, or should we say stages of the hero's journey for an empath. And these stages with modern psychology, psychotherapy, spirituality, and shamanism can be so powerfully mapped out that it can actually give you the GBs. Because if you hear what the chronological cycle, if you could call it that, or biological cycle, chronological, because it's more time-based, of, of an empath or a super empath or the empathic healer is, you can actually stop and ask yourself very, very honestly where you are in this process. And it can be sobering, and I'm warning that this can be a very triggering conversation, but it can be so um, uplifting at the same time. So it's, a, you know, I would like to suggest that, you know, if we look back into culture, okay, I mean, I was just thinking now that, I, like for instance, the Iota impacts and things, there are certain tribes in North America, and also I know of tribes in the Gobi uh, Desert, I know of tribes in quite a few places that actually have words for the person in the tribe, and it was very rare, who was an empath. They didn't really call it an empath. Um, the one word that comes to mind is the Hayota, I think. And um, they were a very specific type of person that could feel everybody's feelings. And there was no doubt about the fact that these beings existed or these human beings existed, but they were extremely rare, so much so that you actually really have to dig around in culture or in folklore uh, and myth to find them. But what's really, really interesting is now jumping ahead in 2022, we, for all intents and purposes, have an absolute plethora of impacts not to the degree where what one would call them the norm, they're still definitely um, the less percentile of the population. But the fact that if you go on Facebook or if you go on these kind of modern platforms and you were to go and find empath groups, some of these groups have 50, 40, 50,000 members worldwide. So there are certainly, or should I say, there is certainly an absolute increase in the amount of empaths that exist. And I mean, before we even dive into the life cycle, the first thing that comes across my mind is I ask myself, why are we on the increase? Why are there more and more of us? And I think we could lose days having that conversation. But what comes to mind for me immediately is quite simply that we are reaching a stage in our evolution where the disillusion of separation is going to be the only way that we're going to survive. And I can put that to you in a thousand different ways. I could even say that it's part of the ascension spiral. I could say that it's part of humanity's moving towards the reunification or the oneness. And I can do that without getting into any form of doctrine. What does that have to do with being an empath? Well, if you think about reading stories of enlightened beings, and stories of people that saw things very differently in the past, you will kind of remember that the one thing that happened to these incredible beings is they didn't see other people as others. They saw them just as reflections or themselves observing themselves from another angle. And I don't need you to take a belief on you. I just want you to consider that one day we will all be super empaths and we will have very little sense of me, just me, without the world and the organism that we are actually part of. But in the meanwhile, which has been the case for quite some time, thousands of years, as far as I can tell, we have existed as the most magnificent paradox. And that paradox is I, as a sit here, as Nathan, am Nathan, the separate entity I have thoughts and feelings that are my own individual. I make my individual 
choices and I have responsibilities. But at the same time, one could easily say that just like a cell in a liver, I am part of a greater thing. I am also God. I am also part of this magnificent universe. And as we know in prayer and in altered states and in fasting, we are able to access either the one or the other of the paradox. And if you're not sure what I mean by that, is when you are in a certain area of your brain or you are prioritizing certain things, you are very, very convinced that it's all about you and you're a bit scared of how you interact with the world. And, and that's the paradox. You are Nathan. But on the other side, as we know, if we slow down certain areas of the temporal lobe, we know that we can have these absolute divine experiences where we forget about separation and suddenly we realize that we are part of this really big whole. So this is not important in this conversation. I just want you to consider that this very complicated thing that you are trying to deal with is an evolution of spirit. It's an evolution. You are the next evolutionary step as a human being. But now before we get too excited here, we need to actually realize that whenever somebody pioneers something, that it can get really, really messy and complicated. And in many ways, we as empaths are pioneering something that is affecting us in ways we were not even expecting. And we're gonna begin that little conversation now. This life cycle of an empath is fascinating because I am gonna go as far as to say, to suggest that we have many similarities as children, I'm literally talking of now as empaths, as an archetype. And I'd like you to really just embrace what I'm saying when I call it an archetype. Because if you have one or two things that are different, that doesn't discount the enormity of how many other things might hit home. But the first thing I'm going to suggest here is that nearly all empaths share at least eight to 10 similarities in childhood around trauma bonding, around unsafety, we'll get into it now. And after that, I want to suggest that nearly all empaths then, as they get a little bit older and they become adults early on in life, take on very similar relationships, and we're going to discuss how and why. And then around that period of their relationships in their 20s, these empaths, so I'm just building you a nice little bridge of where we're going. There tends to be a split in an empath in the 20s and, and early 30s. And that split, which can be remedied later on, tends to be whether the empath is actually themselves in its wound, going to slowly shift and become the narcissist themselves, self-obsessed and essentially almost in desperation from pain, actually becoming in some ways the prickly abuser. Or what often happens is the empath in these difficult relationships is able to learn to express things that they don't know how to express, and we're going to talk about that, and overcome things like build boundaries, which they can't do, and other things which we're going to discuss to the point where they have this mighty victory and they evolve into the next stage of what an empath is, which essentially is a compassionate healer and a holder of space way beyond that of what the average human being is capable. So it's a hero's journey where we all have this thing in common, this wound, which also develops a magnificent, I mean, magnificent set of abilities that almost drive the average empath crazy and eventually almost drive the people in an empath's life crazy. And will you in your darkness, whether you are in a difficult relationship or whether you are able to identify some of the things we're gonna discuss, are you gonna be willing to stand in your own victory and honestly assess where you are? And let's not forget what we know, those of you that have gone very deeply into Jungian philosophy. Let's not forget what we know about the wounded healer. I actually posted a beautiful lecture today on the group where this one uh, psychologist was actually going that there is nothing more profound than a wounded healer that has gone into this darkness and has 
opened up the spectrum of every thought and feeling of what's possible because empaths tend to suffer very, very deeply. So I want you to take this journey with me. And when you're feeling triggered or you're feeling attacked, I want you to just consider that I am suggesting that this is a profound thing that you can bring into the world. So let's look at childhood. And we are not going to spend much time on any of this. I want you to just kind of see how incredible this archetype is. The divine creates archetypes for the simple reason that they have a lot of value for us. So most impacts come from homes that have deep instability. It is usually from one parent, but can be both, and very often includes the death or the abandonment of a parent. Abandonment could even just be that they don't show much interest in you. To make things more interesting about the empath, and, and this is incredible because you can get 100 empaths in the room and at least, at least 90% of them do this on nearly all of these things. It's a fascinating thing. Is that if they do have some form of parental figure, that they tend to have one parental figure that is emotionally unstable. Now, this is where things get absolutely mind-blowing. In having an unstable parent, what happens is the child tends to try and over-control the emotional situation that it finds itself in and develops uncanny abilities that most children don't develop. If I can clarify these abilities for you, they begin to notice micro expressions on adults, which most people don't even de develop in their lives. Feeling that instability and feeling never really safe, they're constantly watching people's breathing, the way that people change their facial expressions. They are able to feel the mood in the room or the frequency in the room. They are able to pick up absolute subtle changes in people's voices that it has been tested that the average human being cannot even hear what they are hearing. But I need you to understand that this beautiful ability is actually born of trauma. What a magnificent thing to consider. And because of that, this trauma will not leave your life and at one stage will need to be addressed. So beautiful. But what's important about child is, is I need you to understand that what essentially happens is that where one would become very focused on becoming mature with one's own feelings and holding space for understanding the maturation of the tides and flows of the emotions that run through the adolescent, what essentially happens is we go inside out and we prioritize a parent usually usually our parent that we feel safest with. And we prioritize that parent to the point where we feel what they feel. We happy when they happy. We sad when they sad. And this, of course, is the first time that we build this archetype. And in the meanwhile, we become highly, highly skilled, but very emotionally in some ways immature. And this schism begins to take place. I could say a lot more about the childhood, but I'm not going to. I think we do get the idea. It's mostly about prioritizing, walking into a room, if we can make it quite visceral, walking into a room and immediately analyzing how somebody is seated. Maybe your mother is looking frustrated. You would immediately push aside whatever you're feeling to see if you could get it to feel better, if you could appease the situation in some way. And this creates essentially a a psychic ability and a mental illness in some way, which is magnificent, it's beautiful. Let's look at it with absolute tenderness. Then where things get really interesting because I would have to talk for three or four hours to go through the entire cycle is if we can just go a little bit ahead and we look at then what begins to happen as a teenager and early love. Now, if we're all honest, we want to hear a little bit about this because Love is something that whether we, it's something we partake in or not, we don't actually realize, or for most of us, it has never occurred to us that being an empath might be the reason that relationships can be 
an absolute nightmare. We just never realized that it had anything to do with being an empath. So I want us to consider that when empaths eventually take on a lover, they often take on a maladaptive narcissist. Now, before we go into this, you know, myself, before we go into this, I want us, there's quite a few things we're going to unpack here. We cannot talk about the maladaptive narcissist without realizing that a very, very interesting thing happens to most um, empaths without them realizing it. And I'm going to be cocky. I'm going to go as far as to say there's probably some of us sitting in the room that don't realize this. But one of the biggest characteristics of this journey that we've now discussed from childhood is that empaths have a rage problem. Now, that is something that every empath I've ever worked with one-on-one -on -one in 10 years looks at me and goes, um, no, no, no. Further from the truth, you couldn't be further from the truth. And if you are an empath in this room that is beginning to experience problems with anger and rage, I want you to wait until you see where we're going. You might be further along your evolution than you think. So if you are someone that's a little bit worried about your temper, I want you to consider that it's not a bad thing. But let's ground again. Because most empaths just literally left the room when I said they have a rage problem. Because we don't know it. And I'm going to try and prove to you that we have a rage problem. So what this has to do with maladaptive narcissism is essentially what happens is a maladaptive narcissist, if you took it on as a lover, has a serious rage and abuse and control and all these things problem. But specifically, specifically, they express rage. And what happened when we were kids is we essentially, in our absolute desperation, you guys need to understand something that we were so worried about losing the a little bit of stability that we had as children that we very quickly learned that rage, which I would like to clarify in case you're backing to get present with me, rage is actually a mixture of emotions. And if I can give you the formula, shame is the first rainbow of rage, anxiety, anger disappointment, self-hate, that's rage. It's a very specific word. You can even, even in psychology, they use the first thing they say about rage, shame. So just try be with me here. Now you must remember that you're trying to control your environments as a child, right? And one of the first things you learn is that certain emotions are not accepted. And of course, what doesn't help us is that we essentially as the way we deal with children is we negatize emotion. So an example would be an empath. Of course, your parents don't know you're an empath at that stage. And maybe you throw a tantrum or you get really angry with something. And of course, it is absolutely shunned. And all you hear is the abandonment thing. And very early on, you learn to put your rage in a box that is not welcome, that is not going to get you loved. And you push that shit so far down that you become the likable, intelligent, very good at communicating. All parents like you. This is in the beginning. So if you got all funny later on, don't worry. I'm talking you at five, seven, eight, nine. Families love it when you come over. You essentially became the world's biggest people pleaser without even knowing how sick it would make you later on. So let's jump into this relationship now that we're just willing to theorize that you have a rage problem. I, I don't even want you to take it on. I want you to just, you know what Aristotle said, that an educated mind can take something on like a wine and swirl it around for a good hour before he goes, he spits it out and goes, no, I don't think that's true. And I want you to swirl with me. Open your palate with me because I tell you, I myself took three years before I decided I didn't express anger. It took me three years. And I don't, I mean, recently. And since then, I still have a problem. So, maladaptive uh, narcissist comes along, and guess what? He can express his rage. 
and he is going to stick to you like glue. Even if you get rid of him, you'll find another one. As long as rage has no space in your life, as long as you are not able to express anger, which later on we will discuss becomes your ability to build boundaries, your ability to throw tantrum, all of those things. And I want you to see how this, how the psychic illness builds, because essentially, if you look at maladaptive narcissism, what they do is they always, think about your relationships now, and I might trigger you a bit, they always start off as the most incredible lovers. They are so filled with praise. They seem almost too good to be true, um, filled with affection, all sorts of stuff. And then they gradually start to turn on you. And usually they begin to turn on you when they realize that they are not getting exactly what it is that they want. Now, this eventually becomes quite abusive where, well, they become more and more shocking by the month. And if you've ever wondered why it is you stay, the most fascinating thing is, now we are at the second stage of this empathic thing, the more you suppress and deny your self-worth, ability to rage, and give yourself permission slip to be fucking angry, the more that that person can control you. And what's absolutely fascinating, and this is why this needs to be discussed in such detail, what the classic empath will do before they have help or are educated, and I still do this sometimes, is they will go to the only tools they have, because remember, abandonment is a massive thing, yeah? And the tools they have are to become more em empathic. That's how they deal with things, to explain themselves more, to try and be more clear, to be more agreeable, to try and do less wrong because this person surely is going to get it eventually because that's your language and their language is now if you want to know why they do that is essentially what they do is just because someone's a narcissist doesn't mean that they don't hurt and a narcissist doesn't like to sit with their pain so what they do is they essentially take that anger and they shift it onto you and you this is where things get complicated you want it that's where things get really, really complicated. So now you're sitting in the situation where he's essentially or she is abusing you and doing all of these things. You can't draw boundaries. You can't do any of those things. And you can see where this could go. So now we're just going to pause for a second. I do not say anything that I'm saying without love. I know I can say it in quite a, gen a difficult way, but I do realize that someone in this room might have been recently or currently in a difficult um, relationship like that. And I want you to not think of it as anything but one of the greatest callings you will ever have in your life. And I want you to consider something very difficult. A lot of us had that relationship a long time ago and then reproduced it a few times and then a very difficult thing happens we start to take on the traits of the narcissist. Why? In absolute desperation, in pain that we're feeling, in the fact that we are not willing once again to work with anger directly because that's shameful and anger is a quality that will not get us accepted. We learned that very early on. That we become like the narcissist in the reason that I say that is because the way that we express pain or fight back actually becomes quite underhanded and nefarious. An example of this, because we can't handle it directly, would be, have you ever noticed as empaths that you are literally the most incredible partners and you keep becoming more and more agree agreeable and just flooding them with love? But in the end, you often turn into the monster. And that's kind of been pushed into. So very often that person will be absolutely stunned with what they're dealing with by the end. And that's how far we allow ourselves to be taken. So I want you to consider how big this part is to do with things, because we're going to talk about what you can do about it later on. But what's magnificent is you've either become the narcissist 
and you're willing to admit it and you're willing to remedy it, or you're going to realize just how wounded you might feel. Now, as we go deeper into trigger land, and, and maybe that even inspires you to get out of the relationship because we're going to discuss what we can do about it. Deeper into trigger land, if we go to stage three of empaths, partly I think because they can sense in their souls that they are a part of an evolution and that there is something very important going on with starting to feel other people's feelings and things and be able to take things on, et cetera, et cetera. Where things get interesting yeah, is that nearly all empaths become enamored in spirituality. And most empaths become some form of a healer, even if it's amateur. And I don't mean amateur like not good. I just mean it doesn't have to be professional. But what's fascinating, because we're talking about the triggering side, is that one of the reasons why spirituality calls an empath so deeply is because they are able to garner and create an environment of compassion, acceptance, love, divinity, all those things that are true and exist, but keep them far away from those parts of them that they are denying, which is absolute rage. And of course, very far away from rejection, abandonment. So essentially, the thing we've got to be cautious in the evolution of an empath is nearly all empaths are spiritual. Nearly all empaths bypass rage. And here's where it gets tricky. Nearly all empaths become spiritually arrogant. It's just a phase. It's just a phase. I, I love that you guys can own this. I love it. It's just a phase. But like it comes from, guys, you've got to understand something. You haven't had boundaries your whole life. You've been hurt from the moment you were, you were born. You know without a fact that you are generally, now I'm being playful here, so please don't, the better person in most exchanges, you know that you gave more in relationships, you know that you do no harm and you do not you do nothing but love. So you've got to understand when you keep having the same response from the world, you essentially become well arrogant. And that spiritual arrogance is one of the saddest things about empaths. Anybody sitting in this room, I can assure you, knowing me, knew that I was going to tackle the shadow side of this. But I want you to do something, and you'll see how heartbroken I am by what has happened, by what I believe is a group of people sent to change the world, is that the empaths have fallen. And I think it's sad. And why do I say that? Let me give you a few reasons. Go into a room. I mean, I, I am a part of about 14 Facebook groups to do with empaths. And the only ones I'm part of are the ones where they're like, empowerment of the empath or whatever. There's nothing like that in those groups. It is nothing like that. I want to challenge you. I want you to go spend a week in one of the empath groups. You know what it is? It's a wine festival. Everyone sits and moans about how the world is hurting them and how... It's, a, it's an area of victimization. And guys, you need to understand something. And this is just my perspective. We are becoming, we are trying to evolve something. And any metamorphosis or growth incurs through pain. And what I'm saying is that this wasn't going to be easy. But I would go as far as to say that hundreds and thousands of impacts worldwide have stopped in the boo-boo zone. Oh, poor me, I can't control what I feel. And I, I know I'm being triggering because I, I spent most of my life there. But the worst part is now we have social media and we make groups where we disempower each other. And I want you to do your own investigation. I want you from this new perspective of what this magnificent thing we are being called to become, I want you to go and sit in an impact group for a week and tell me you can do it. It is literally like the average post is like, hey guys, like how do you cope with when someone negatives in your house? Or hey guys, don't you find it? Hey guys, I mean, it's like, it's tiring, man. It's tiring. And at the same time, they're right. They're honest. To be an empath is to constantly be bombarded with things, feelings that are not necessarily yours. But the really difficult thing that empaths don't realize is that 
that thing can only trigger and affect you if you are not complete with that emotion within yourself. An example is empaths complain most about aggressive, angry, self-assured people. Hmm, did you see the link there because of our lack of understanding to our own rage? And what's incredible is if you just get comfortable with your own anger and understand that there is a divine right to actually be angry sometimes within you know, a certain healthy perspective, people that throw tantrums won't upset you. You will sit there and go, okay, I think he's taken this anger a bit far. Or you'll be like, mm, this looks like healthy anger. But if you are complete with anger within yourself, you are not going to sit there as some empath who's completely drained because you were around anger. So spirituality is a very complicated subject here because I am suggesting that later on these beings become the most incredible healers if they are able to face certain things like take full responsibility for their emotions, like understand that they have a deep trauma spectrum to fix. And unfortunately, because we as empaths, I did the same thing, by the way, take on this spiritual healer thing quite quickly because of the area of bypassing it gives us. It just makes us feel safe and it makes sense to us because empaths tend to be from a zone in the universe where there is not a lot of discord and not a lot of reason to be angry. So there are many sides to it. And what makes this really interesting now is that um, the spirituality can hurt us, first of all, because once we hold that role for people, we don't allow ourselves to actually experience those things that we as empaths label lower, even though it is part of our redemption. Nearly all empaths' redemption lie, if you want a sentence to know what I really think, lies in walking directly into shame and embracing rage, as strange as that sounds. So what often happens is spirituality damages these beings deeply because um, they, they feel like they have to keep looking a certain way for other people. They've demonized it within themselves. And very often the empathic healer causes far damage, more damage to other people in the long run than they ever mean to. And an example would be that very often empathic healers, because they are completely disempowered within themselves, because they fear outside energies, because they tend to start to believe in intrinsic evil, which tends to mean something outside of yourself that is not part of the collective, then what happens is they start to spread a lot of superstition. And that's where things can be quite tricky, is these very, very, um, let's call them psychic individuals, or these individuals that have incredible abilities to tell you what's going on with yourself. How could you not want to listen to this healer? This healer is like, oh, you're feeling this, you're feeling this, but then often leaving you disempowered. And if you want to know if you are one of those healers, or if you want to know whether you are working with one of those healers, it's very simple. Do you feel empowered? And as though you have everything that is required to accomplish what you need to accomplish when you are done with them or when they are done with you, right? That's the benchmark. Think about that for a second. If you go and see a psychic and you feel completely better about yourself, but you're convinced that if you feel something else bugging you, you better get over there quickly so it can save you, that you're working with a, an, an empath that is not completely liberated. Because any person that moves right beyond the spectrum and becomes fearless in energy will leave you wondering why you were scared of anything in the first place. So that's a very triggering part about that. But man, I can tell you that I only know a few empaths that have become fully liberated. They are absolutely fearless and they hold the space. And that is a possibility for all of us they hold a space that literally creates ripples through reality. And if you are in any of these wars as an empath, an empath in love, an empath in spirituality, because these tend to be fronts that we fight all at once, just know the greatness that I feel you're being called to. In a relationship, let's have that discussion. So never mind this, this anger thing. 
and the abandonment thing, abandonment thing, the boundaries, boundaries are an absolutely massive part of this conversation. <coughs> We're going to talk about it a little bit at the end when we're looking into solutions, um, which is not far away. But I just want you to consider that um, there are things that we can actually do, but these relationships will tend to repeat over and over and over. And it is often said in a lot of people's research that it is even difficult for two empaths to actually have a, have a good relationship for the simple reason that um, they need to actually understand the spectrum of what is going on. And we're going to discuss that now. So what you'd have to ask yourself before we moved on would be, okay, there's most likely I've got a little bit of some of this playing out, but am I a wounded empath? The answer is probably yes. Okay. We'll do a little bit of a spectrum. As you guys know, I don't really like working off, off lists or whatever, but I did make a little piece of paper here, here about five minutes before we started, where I wrote some of the things where you can identify if you are a wounded empath. But before we get anxious, I just want you to consider, yes, you probably are. How do I know? Because it's an incredible ability. And we have not been given the roadmap. I would like to be so arrogant as to suggest that I am hoping that some people that are on this journey with me are going to actually become so inspired by their own process of becoming an empowered empath or the compassionate empath, the next level, that you will actually begin to guide people through this process because I believe there are plenty empaths and I believe that we need a roadmap. And I only know of a few people even around the world that are building this roadmap. And I think that it is, I mean, empaths are suffering. We're talking about people with the biggest hearts in the world that are made themselves this small and are literally walking around finding abuse at every corner. And it is our responsibility to embrace this and understand what it is that we are up to and the wounds that we have to turn over. I am suggesting that the pain that sits within you is going to become your power. So how do you know if you are a wounded empath? Well, the first thing is you're probably drained or exhausted all the time. That's a possibility. There's many reasons for it. I don't have hours to talk. Those of you that have a little bit of a, um, um, a medical background will know what adrenals do when you're in an unsafe environment as a child, high levels of anxiety. Um, you must remember that when an empath decides to prioritize somebody else's emotions, they essentially stop possessing their own body. And that means you have no house, that you're not completely safe within your house. And that can cause a lot of adrenal problems, can cause a lot of emotional instability. And what's really interesting is I know some of you study trauma. This is a, a, a kind of trauma as well, you know, just having a childhood like that. And uh, that shows up in your body as well. So that's a possibility, of course. Um, sometimes on the other side of the spectrum, empaths are completely numb, completely numb. Most empaths hold the belief that they only have two options, to be com constantly bombarded with pain or to completely shut the world out. That is the option that the average empath has. And they create a protective shield over themselves. And this shield, unfortunately, can create quite a high level of disassociation. So later on in life, what happens is how you would know if you're a wounded empath is um, you'd become quite prickly to be around. You're quite dominating and controlling of your environment. You become judgmental of people that express vibrationally differently to you. And um, it's complicated, guys. It's very, very hard being a very, very high level. And when I say high level, I mean sensitivity impact. So, um, yeah, those are all possibilities within the spectrum. Um, most impacts suffer from some sort of depression, uh, anxiety, uh, very, very often autoimmune diseases, fibromyalgia, pain in the joints, um, very, very common body pains that don't really make a lot of sense. And that, of course, just depends on how big your traumatic, your trauma spectrum is from childhood. Um, but all very, very interesting. And of course, um, codependent relationships. 
It doesn't just have to be your lover. Codependent relationships are one of the number one things of a wounded empath. And codependent relationships usually don't leave an empath as well off as the other person. And we've discussed why already. They just keep giving and giving and giving. Empaths are often frustrated and confused about life. You already know about the maladaptive narcissist lovers that they take on. I'll see when I, if there are anything else I want to add. Um, yeah, no, you don't have to go too into that. So it's absolutely, it's absolutely fasc fascinating to, to see what happens. So what are the solutions? I mean, I'm cutting short here, right? But what are the solutions? And there really, really are solutions. The first thing I want to suggest is we really need to own our emotions. We need to fully, fully understand that even if something in our environment is upsetting us, it is unhealed in ourselves. So for me, the first level would be taking emotionally, emotional responsibility. And that's a really, really difficult thing really difficult because we might have serious traumas. An example of how this might outplay is you might have had a lot of screaming in your home when you were a kid. And of course, we already know everything we've explained. And being around shouting now might be one of the most difficult things for you. And you do not have to heal this. You do not have to learn to become around society again. But I want you to consider that if you take this hero's journey into your own shadow and you feel it is correct for you, then what will happen is you will become valuable beyond belief in the way that you can penetrate people's dark states and into communities as a healer. What else? Well, we need to learn what boundaries actually are. And you see how this links into rage. So when I say rage, I'm not talking about running around smashing people in the head. I'm talking about not acceptable. There is a healthy rage. If you look through mythology, many divine beings raged. How true it is, I don't know. It's in mythology. So boundaries, uh, some of you have seen that I've recently just written about boundaries, and, and I'm sure you saw. I, I wrote the piece as short as possible, and it was like five paragraphs. It's got a lot to do with identifying what is okay for you and what is not. It's got to do with how you hold boundaries. It's got to do with standing in your boundary. It's got to do with knowing that you deserve that boundary and how to navigate boundaries. Because when you're dealing with a narcissist, oh my goodness. And the worst thing is why boundaries actually don't work for an empath. Even if you've become the narcissist already, it's okay. Why they don't work for the empath is because the empath is so scared of being in any form of conflict or because remember, as a child, you need to be around as much safety as possible. Then essentially what happens is that you try and only draw the boundary when things are completely terrible. And then what you've got is a bully who once a month, you essentially try and put your foot down and that bully is like, oh, hell no, hell no. And whether they end up hurting you or actually physically harming you um, and all you doing is being loving and absolutely, this is your language of love. This is how deep the love of your soul is. You just trying to say, look, I can love you no matter what, like just don't get to the point where you, you're cutting me, uh, proverbially. And so you try and draw that boundary. And unfortunately, a, an empath needs to actually be trained. And I mean trained, like I don't mean like it has to be formal, on how to hold the boundary. So I'm not going to get lost into this, right? Because we'd be here forever. I want you to just know, like I know there's someone in this room that's actually working the boundaries with me now. And it's an incredible thing. Like the first time you say no to someone. <gasps> and the first time that you like, so this is going to make us about a few minutes too late, but I want to tell you an example of how all of this outplays, right? To give you an example of how personalize it, boundaries and so what happens is one of the reasons why an empath becomes a little bit spiritual, com spiritually complicated or arrogant is because they become martyrs. And 
as I said, I really understand why we do that because we really are what we think we are. We really love the way we love and we do get quite abused. But this martyrdom starts to really permeate in our language of love. So like, you know what a martyr is? I'm not going to explain it. And an example now is when someone begins to abuse you in a friendship or in a relationship, in some sick way, you believe that they care about you. And in some sick way, the more you can prove and this is not conscious, trust me, this is not conscious. The more that you can prove that you're the martyr, in other words, they're the bad person and you just keep coming back with love and this can become quite a sick cycle. What's a really good sign is that if you've already in a stage where you've started to develop boundaries or you've begun to understand how important it is and also at the same time, you've begun to express anger because anger can be expressed healthily then there's very, very simplistic things that we can do. One of the best things an empath can possibly do is emotional labeling. An example of this would be if Ngozi and I are having a conversation and as an empath, she's, she's freaking out and something's wrong and she's angry with me about something. And now as an empath, usually it becomes blurred and I wouldn't be coping with the situation. And what I'm gonna tell you now seems childish, but I want you to research this They've done, um, they've done scans where they actually watch um, the, uh, co uh, the cortex of emotions with empaths when they do this and they actually begin to calm down and separate. So what it is, is you must use nearly every sentence to explain what you think that person's you, uh, experiencing and what you're experiencing. So let me break it down for you. So Gauzy will finish uh, her sentence and I will say, okay, so... What I'm understanding and feeling, Ngozi, is that you, you're very irritable with me, am I correct? And you're feeling a little bit betrayed and you think maybe I could have helped, you know? Okay, do you see how specific that is? And then what I need to, what I also need to do was I need to be very similar with that. I need to learn what is my emotion. In other words, okay, what I'm feeling is that's making me a little bit anxious that you're angry with me and creating that de-alienation is so important. It seems silly, but you get really, really deep into it. <clears throat> and what's fascinating, if you think it's not an important practice, I am um, recently, a friend of mine in the States sent me the coursework. What they do is they treat they teach um, certain healers how to become empaths now obviously they're not talking about what we are but to increase their empathic abilities and what was absolutely fascinating is that they teach them how to identify what other people are feeling now usually that stuff just bounces around in our heads and we can't tell the difference if it is ours or theirs why this becomes quite important is essentially an empath as they grow, starts to develop other empaths in their lives. And empaths have never had their emotions prioritized ever. So if you find an empath as a lover or a friend or a brother or a sister, the most beautiful thing you can possibly do to an empath is protect yourself by explaining what's yours and what's theirs. Because what they hear is actually, oh my goodness, this person is listening to me. They're prioritizing me. So for instance, one empath talking to another, because it's very often a narcissist, once you draw boundaries, just gonna be out of that door. Once you've got your boundaries figured out. So one empath talking to another would be something like, okay, so Lisa, if I understand you correctly, you feel very disrespected by what I did in the boardroom yesterday. And I'm assuming like it feels like, I think you're expressing that it's a bit of betrayal. And now if Lisa was an empath and she was being spoken to like that, especially if it's really what she's telling you, it would be a validation of what she's feeling. She would feel heard. She might correct me but where she would usually push herself onto the back thing. And I do believe that this kind of um, communication is going to become the norm within 50 years. An example of it is usually if you want to know how spirit is expanding within us, 
you need to look at the top spiritual practices. What have you guys noticed? One of the top spiritual practices in the world at the moment is this new idea. I mean, my entire organization is built on it, holding space. Holding space got nothing to do with giving advice. Holding space has got nothing to do with fixing people. Holding space is this idea that you can allow someone to bring any thoughts and any emotions up to the surface and you are simply going to acknowledge their pain, be with their pain, accept their pain and sit with it. And these are, are prime spiritual practices, even if you work with trauma. I mean, you know, very often when you're letting someone's trauma out, you don't even touch them because you can interrupt the process. So it's a really, really big conversation. It's a conversation about whether you, where you are in this evolution and this spectrum. Most of us have wounds that just are going to be there for some time and might never go away. I'll give you an example of one of mine is that um, I only identified about a year ago is over explaining. That is a trauma response because you were too scared to be misunderstood. And it's very hurtful for an empath because they know they never, ever mean wrong. They never mean harm when they are misunderstood. And a large amount of our energy can go into trying to over explain, which we then in, in the other side find very hurtful if we are under explained back. But of course, we can find people that communicate like us, they'd like to share what it is they're thinking and feeling and doing, etc. So it's a really big conversation. And as I said, the boundaries thing is such a huge, I could do an hour just on how to build boundaries. I honestly, the first time someone told me I needed boundaries, I was like, you're going to tell me that a mental illness that I'm dealing with, that is also a spiritual ability can be sorted out with boundaries. Go pull someone's other leg, get out. That honestly was my attitude. Now that I'm going down the rabbit hole, I didn't even know I didn't have boundaries. Oh my God, now that I've got boundaries, first of all, you lose a lot of people really quickly because they don't like this new version of you that values yourself. Oh no, because most narcissists throw you into the spectrum and out. So what I mean is they, they abuse you and then they reel you back in when they need stuff or when they're feeling a loss of something and then they throw you out and they reel you back in and remember, I don't think the narcissist is the big bad guy. Hey? Narcissists are in pain as well. But and also don't forget that a lot of us have become narcissists or are permanent narcissists already. So this is not, oh, there's one poor little uh, spectrum. And I'm just saying that like, you really need to realize how much boundaries has got to do with this. And unfortunately, empaths don't realize that no one, is in so much pain that they cannot respect you. Do you know how often when an empath is trained how to hold boundaries, that, okay, I'll give you an example, how, like if I'm training someone to hold boundaries, right? And it, it's life-changing. Here's an example. An empath believes that that person's in so much pain that that's why they treat them this way. But then in the very same room, that it, that narcissist will treat while they're having their freak out, while they drunk, whatever it is, they will treat the person in the room with strong boundaries, with respect, even in the middle of the freak out. So this idea that um, we can accept any disrespect ever, ever, ever is completely illusional. And it's very hard to reset at some stages, but I'm telling you now that you get so brutal about it eventually that I've written a list, if you want, um, email me and I will upload it for you guys. It's like a little bit of a how-to, it's mind-blowing. It's absolutely mind-blowing. The second you're being disrespected, I'm not talking about freaking out, you go immediately, I want to just let you know that I'm feeling disrespected. I'll give you an example. I'll, I'll make it a very simple one. Someone's at your house and there's children around and this person keeps using profanities that are absolutely like, you crawling, you're so uncomfortable, and it's a friend of yours. Now, what an empath would do, always convinced that they're a good person, trying to keep the peace, is they would suppress it, and this later on in their friendships comes out in resentment, right? Resentment is that energy that turns us dangerous in um, relationships later on because we don't. So what you could actually just do, once you've trained yourself in boundaries, is when you're walking this friend to the door, 
without being all worked up because an empath never draws a boundary now to be freak out. You do this all the time. So you're like, I just want to let you know before you go, I was a little bit uncomfortable this evening. It's really not okay to talk in front of the kids like that, man. I can't have that here. Please, can I just have you acknowledge that you understand why? First of all, if you're drawing a boundary and someone doesn't agree with you, they should be out of your life anyway, because you only draw a boundary when you're getting hurt or when something's happening that shouldn't be happening. Okay. And there's a simple example. And then they acknowledge it and then it's over. Most empaths have the secret belief that it's going to be the end of the world if they were to just express what they're feeling. And you know why? First of all, because their parents rejected their emotions, they rejected their emotions. And then just to make sure it was there for life, they created the maladaptive narcissist as the first lover who didn't give a shit about their emotions. So that is a really, really tricky, difficult conversation. But what I can tell you is that few things they need to do. There's boundaries. There's learning to label what is their emotions and what isn't. There's going into the old wounds to discover why certain things like raising of voices or whatever triggers you that way, which is not unique to being an empath. Most adults end up in therapy anyway because that trauma from childhood comes up. And then here's a strange one. Empaths need to clear superstition out of their lives because you know why empaths are spiritually superstitious? because they have been feeling shit their entire lives that they couldn't explain even in spirituality. And that is the bomb. So what very often happens is you were sent here to become a spiritual powerhouse of earth that is unstoppable, unbreakable, unmovable. And unfortunately, somewhere in the process, because we're not getting much guidance, what has happened in your desperation to explain the inertia, the pain, sensitivities, anxieties, sensations, and things that you feel, you have gone to extrasensory explanations. In other words, you have even gone to very prone to very woo-woo ideas, which of course for a spiritual person is not hard. And then what happens is the impact becomes compromised and they're in fear. They don't feel safe spiritually. And because they can't switch their spirituality off, they essentially infect other people with the fact that spirituality and the world and God and entities and creatures and angels and things are not safe. This is the responsibility that is on our laps as impacts. But I would like to close in telling you that as much as I'm triggering you, those superstitions can be removed. And the way they are removed is generally through your victories of your own life, realizing that nothing can harm. You are an eternal being. Nothing could ever happen to you. You're an eternal being. You always have been and you always will be. What is going to happen to you? You can have sensationary experiences. You could lose energy at some stage. You might lose your body at some stage, but you've always existed. So what the big spiritual fear that the empath has is essentially just that they're tired of hurting and they've now begun to believe. So the superstition is a big part of it. In closing, I just want you to know what the possibilities are for you though. It's absolutely magnificent. I want you to picture a version of you that down the line has this ability to read facial expressions, know what people are feeling, read between the lines, walk into a room and know exactly what's going on in there. And when someone talks about pain or when someone talks about insanity or someone talks about insecurity, someone talks about weird stuff, there is almost nothing that they can't bring up that you have not experienced. Because what the impact is, is, is the being that comes here to feel the full spectrum of divine madness. And once you go through that shadow work, what comes out on the other side is the greatest space holder you can imagine with the highest level of love you can imagine. And the empath will know that they are through this process and ready to take what they have to the world if they themselves feel safe. 
No one can tell you how to be safe. And I'm hoping some of you take this journey on for yourselves. I'm here if anybody needs help or guidance. As you know, I work with people regarding this. I will leave information um, inside the when I do upload this um, inside the comment sections for anyone who needs to kind of connect with me or know more. But mostly, I just wanted to have this conversation with you to see if it would help you identify. As you know, there is far more good stuff about empaths in the world than of what I've been talking about. I just feel like we really are focusing on things that are not empowering us. This conversation can catapult us. All of that other stuff is true. It is special. It is wonderful. But not if it is leaving us in a place where we choose to be the martyr who is being hurt by the world. Because that is certainly not what this ability has brought me. And I can't wait to bring the emotional fearlessness that it has finally brought me to the rest of the world. Thank you.